As the tension builds, more and more Jews come to realize that they're dead if they can't somehow reestablish their relationship with Yahweh. It's just like back in the days of the judges, when Yahweh had said, You have forsaken me and served other gods. Therefore, I will deliver you no more. Go and cry out to the gods which you have chosen. Let them deliver you in your time of distress. And the children of Yisrael said unto Yahweh, We have sinned. Do to us whatever seems best to you. Only deliver us this day, we pray. So they put away the foreign gods from among them, and served Yahweh. And his soul could no longer endure the misery of Yisrael. Judges 10, 13 through 16. Yahweh apparently can't stay angry in the face of true repentance. By ones and twos, then by hundreds and thousands, Jews resolve that it must never again be like the days before the Babylonian captivity when Yahweh, the God of their father, sent warnings to them by his messengers, rising up early and sending them, because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God, despised his words, and scoffed at his prophets, until the wrath of Yahweh arose against his people, till there was no remedy. Second Chronicles 36, 15 and 16 No, they would not mock these young messengers who were so obviously under the protection of Almighty God. To do so would be suicide. These 144,000 young zealots are right. It's time to repent. Some people today think that the Old Testament is a complete turn-off. They, not having read it, complain that it's all hell, fire, and brimstone, wrath, and retribution. Where is the loving, personal God we see throughout the New Testament? Excuse Revelation. We need to come to grips with the fact that it's all the same God. The Bible is one continuous story from beginning to end. The same compassionate deity who personally paid the penalty for our sins is also seen wreaking vengeance in a thousand Old Testament passages. How can this be? How does wrath square with forgiveness? Like any loving father, Yahweh wants his children doing well. He gives us opportunities, guidance, support, and love. When we screw up, and we all do, he even provides a way for us to come back into his good graces, providing for us, as the ubiquitous metaphor describes it, a garment of light that hides our sin from his eyes. All we have to do is put it on. But what's a father to do when some of his children rebel against him, refusing to accept his help, even going so far as to attack their siblings who want to have a close relationship with him? Love can't be forced. The father can only give his rebellious children time to repent, while, when it suits his purpose, protecting those who choose to love him. At some point, though, time runs out. The father must turn his back on the rebels, cut off their support, and write them out of the will. He finds no pleasure in doing so. But it's not his choice. It's ours. That, in a nutshell, is what we see happening in the story of the Bible. Yahweh has given his children 6,000 years in which to repent. Some have, and some have not. But as he said in the days of Noah, My spirit shall not strive with man forever. Genesis 6.3 The day will come when God will say, Enough! It is that day of which the wrathful Old Covenant scriptures speak when they describe the judgment of God, though the subject is brought up all the time in the New Covenant as well. And although many, even most, of these prophetic wrath passages have seen some degree of fulfillment in history, I believe that most were intended to ultimately apply to the events of the final seven years before the return of Christ, especially to the war of Gog and Magog and its aftermath. 
For example, there is no remotely literal fulfillment in history for many of Isaiah's prophecies. Come near, you nations, to hear and heed, you people. Let the earth hear, and all that is in it, the world and all things that come forth from it. For the indignation of Yahweh is against all nations, and his fury against all their armies. He has utterly destroyed them. He has given them over to the slaughter. Also their slain shall be thrown out. Their stench shall rise from their corpses, and the mountains shall be melted with their blood. Isaiah 34, 1-3 This hasn't happened yet, except in a very limited and localized sense. But in the last days, no one will be able to hide from the wrath of Yahweh. All nations will be judged. This passage reveals that the war of Magog will spread beyond the Middle East to involve the whole earth. We'll explore how that might happen in a later chapter. Note also that there will be too many corpses to bury. The death toll from the war of Magog will exceed 1.5 billion people, one quarter of the earth's population, 300 times the unspeakable carnage of World War II. That number is revealed in reference to the fourth seal judgment. Power was given to them, death and Hades, over a fourth of the earth to kill with the sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. Revelation 6.8 Therefore, it shouldn't be such a surprise that the Bible spends so much time warning us about it. Isaiah goes on to say, Please hear this, you who are afflicted and drunk, but not with wine. He's speaking to Israel here, who is reeling from her affliction. Thus says Yahweh your God, who pleads the cause of his people. See, I have taken out of your hand the cup of trembling, the dregs of the cup of my fury. You shall no longer drink it, but I will put it into the hand of those who afflict you, who have said to you, Lie down, that we may walk over you. And you have laid your body like the ground, and as the street for those who walk over. Isaiah 51, 21-23 That's a perfect description of Israel and her adversaries in the final years. Dar al-Islam wants to walk all over her, and Israel has been over backwards trying to be fair with its Arab citizens, stopping barely short of committing national suicide. God reminds Israel that it's his fury that they have been enduring for the last 2,000 years since they rejected their Messiah. But that is about to change. The shoe of adversity is about to go on to the other foot. Isaiah later says, According to their deeds, accordingly he will repay. Fury to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies. The coastlands he will fully repay. So shall they fear the name of Yahweh from the west, and his glory from the rising of the sun, when the enemy comes in like a flood. The Spirit of Yahweh will lift up a standard against him. Isaiah 59, 18 and 19 Here is confirmation that Yahweh intends to wait until Gog's armies have invaded Israel before he destroys them. But notice that his judgment won't fall only on the nations who march into Israel. The outlying areas, the coastlands, will also receive his attention. Why would anybody attack God's chosen people? His word is abundantly clear about the fate of those who do. There is a very short list of possible answers. One, you don't know any better. But since the Bible is the world's best-selling book, that's a pretty lame excuse. Two, you don't think there is a God, that the Bible is just a collection of myths and fairy tales. But to believe that in the 21st century, you've got to be willingly ignorant of a great many things. Or three, you think you're smarter, better, or stronger than Yahweh. Or you think your God is, which is the status of Gog's Muslim hordes. In a fascinating discourse that took place long before there even were Jews or Arabs on this planet, a man named Job philosophized about that. He said, 
How can a man be righteous before God? If one wished to contend with him, he could not answer him one time out of a thousand. God is wise in heart and mighty in strength. Who has hardened himself against him and prospered? He does great things past finding out, yes, wonders without number. If he goes by me, I do not see him. If he moves past, I do not perceive him. If he takes away, who can hinder him? Who can say to him, What are you doing? God will not withdraw his anger. The allies of the proud lie prostrate beneath him. Job 9, 2 through 4, 10 and 13. Unfortunately, we don't talk with that kind of eloquence anymore. Now, the best we can come up with is, what kind of stupidity would it take to purposely challenge the God who made you? Job goes on to say, Yahweh makes nations great and destroys them. He enlarges nations and guides them. He takes away the understanding of the chiefs of the people of the earth and makes them wander in a pathless wilderness. They grope in the dark without light, and he makes them stagger like a drunken man. Job 12:23 through 25 Pretty astute for a guy whose idea of a nation was a thousand people who could actually get along with each other. His assessment is still true today, more poignant than ever. If potentates and presidents refuse to walk in his light, he will eventually flip off the switch. Job's friend Elihu had a good grasp on the awesome power of Yahweh as well. Surely God will never do wickedly, nor will the Almighty pervert justice. Who gave him charge over the earth, or who appointed him over the whole world? If he should set his heart on it, if he should gather to himself his spirit and his breath, all flesh would perish altogether, and man would return to dust. Job 34 12 through 15. In case you've been living too long in this present world, those were rhetorical questions he was asking. Nobody put Yahweh in charge. He just is. We need to be reminded, often, that it is only God's constant care that makes life possible. If he were to merely hold his breath, we would not survive two minutes. Strangely, one biblical word that modern Christians often choke on is vengeance. It was used three times, for example, in Moses' quote we saw a bit earlier. The increasingly liberal society we live in finds an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth a barbaric concept. Nowadays, folks would much rather think in terms of rehabilitation which explains why they have no idea how to cope with the evil of Islam. They have been conditioned to shudder at the thought of anyone, even God, being the personification of absolute truth, as in, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John 14:6. If that were so, they reason quite rightly, they would be held to a standard of holy conduct themselves, one they have no intention of trying to live up to. So to avoid this uncomfortable reality, they insist that there is no black or white, only shades of gray, that vengeance is a crude relic of our caveman past, that there are no concrete standards of behavior, that morality is situational. But if that were really true, our legal system would find itself with no foundation. If we rehabilitate people whom society finds inconvenient, instead of punishing people who do wrong, we become the most immoral and irrational of people. Law degenerates into the capricious bludgeon of those in power. If we're honest with ourselves, we all sense that there actually are such things as right and wrong. Ask the man who's being mugged whether he still believes there's no such thing as moral absolutes. But where do the standards come from? 
They emanate from the one who created us, who planted a sense of conscience within us and backed it up with his recorded commandments, his Torah or instructions. We can deny it all we want, but deep down inside, we know it's wrong when we murder, steal, cheat on our spouses, and lie about our fellow man in order to gain an advantage. That's why we try to keep such things a secret. The one thing guaranteed to kill an insanity defense is an attempt to hide the crime. 